Now we're going to look at Galatians 3, 15 to 25, particularly verses 22 to 25, but it has a larger, I want us to see a larger context. This is a blend of historical and experiential elements, representing progressively revealed truths of the plan of salvation. These truths are timeless, universal, and trans-historical. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to the seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party. But God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. One more. But Scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. All right. So this is a passage that is important for us to understand. And, and uh, I'm going to, I've, you have a section on this in your book in chapter 7. <clears throat> in chapter 7, where I'm applying the experiential and historical applications of Old and New, uh, old and new Covenants. Um, it's the second passage that I refer to. I go first, start with Galatians 4, because Paul lets us into his mind on what he's talking about when he talks about the covenants, when he, when he says, uh, I'm talking here about two covenants. And then, the, then, then we go to Galatians chapter 3. So, I'm hoping, I'm continuing to try to clarify um, this presentation. And I've, I've restructured it in a little different way than you have in your book, but it's essentially saying the same thing. And in the book, it's simpler um, than, than it is here. But I still want to, I want you to just follow with me here. And then you will, have, you will have to, on your own, when you go back and process it on your own, see... Um, uh, you, you may see some things differently, and that's, that's fine. Um, and I'll be interested to know that as, you, as you, you know, continue to process it. Through class, I need to get through the presentation, and then, and then uh, it's possible that we'll start um, Wednesday morning with an entire session just on questions and responses to what we've been doing all this time. I do have another presentation I could give, but you have, you have enough of that. In, you have that in your book, and I wouldn't have to give that one. So here we go. This is how the evangelical understanding um, is to this passage. That during the Sinai covenant period, we were held in custody under the law. Just taking that phrase right out of, out of, the, uh, out of that passage. And then faith in Jesus Christ when he comes in history. So we're asking the question... Was this meant to be understood historically? Or is there a way that can be understood um, experientially? The same with the law as our guardian, or the King James, I think, has schoolmaster, and the, I think the New King James has tutor <coughs> here. That during the Sinai covenant period, the law is our tutor, our, our schoolmaster, our guardian, and once Jesus comes in history, we're no longer under the schoolmaster or guardian. 
So should we understand this historically? During this period, the law is our guardian, and we're no longer under a guardian once Jesus comes. And as you, as you know, what, the, what that means to evangelicals is that, that the entirety of the, of the law here, uh, many of them anyway, um, <coughs> the entirety of the law, and certainly things such as the Sabbath, no longer apply because Jesus has come now. We're no longer under that rule. Is there a way this can be understood experientially? That's the question we're exploring. <coughs> and I want to do it through a, through a uh, discussion of progressive revelation. So <coughs> I'll do this, I'll make this as simple as I can in the process, but truths about the nature and character of God and the plan of salvation are timeless and universal regardless of when they were first revealed in Scripture. That's what I mean by progressive revelation. That's my definition of progressive revelation. No matter when something is expressed in Scripture, if, it's about the, if, the, if the expression in the Bible is about the nature and character of God or about the plan of salvation, that it didn't suddenly come into existence when the statement appears in Scripture. And I have to demonstrate that. Um, Okay, yes. Alexander. Alexander, thank you. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can, can it do so. Those who are in the real realm of the flesh cannot please God. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you, but if by the spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. All right. Question: When was this first written? When was this statement written? Who wrote it? Paul. Paul right? You do not have the extended discussion of the flesh and the spirit in the Old Testament as you do in the New Testament. At least not in that language. Not with that nomenclature, right? Okay. When did the truth represented here first become true? When did it begin, this truth? With who? Yes, in the Garden of Eden, with Adam, right? So, we have here, this is what I mean by progressive revelation. We have a statement made all the way into the New Testament, well into the New Testament period, that the flesh equals death, the spirit equals life, but that didn't begin there. The flesh didn't suddenly come into existence there, and, this, and the spirit suddenly come into existence and begin to give life, and the flesh engendered death. That was true all the way back to Adam's fall, wasn't it? It was true for all of Adam's, Adam's children, all of, all of his descendants. Okay, so now we can move Right along here. Um, Jonathan. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Flesh gives ber birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. Okay. So, again, when did this first become true? By the way, when was it, when was it first spoken with that kind of language? With Jesus, right? Yeah, Jesus is the one who, who made that statement. But when did it first become true? Yeah. Always, it was from, from the time that Adam sinned, right? Then, we, then there needed to be new birth again. Can anyone, be saved, can anyone ever be saved without being born again and born of the Spirit? Our understanding is no, right? It's a, is this a timeless and universal truth of the plan of salvation? Yes, we understand it to be a timeless and universal truth. The flesh is death, the spirit is life. Flesh gives birth to flesh, so we can't convert somebody. Our children are born the same way we were born, in the flesh. And the spirit gives birth to spirit. We must be born again. <coughs> um, no one can see the kingdom of God, Jesus said, unless they are born again. 
So Dale Ratzlaff, in one of his uh, uh, proclamation magazines, he, he's the one that wrote the book that, that uh, got me going on the covenants to start with. A uh, former Adventist minister who left the church and then said he's now new covenant. He was old covenant when he was an Adventist, and now he's new covenant. He writes here, Before Jesus died and rose again, the Holy Spirit was in the world and inspired and taught people, but he did not permanently indwell people and give them new hearts. Holy Spirit didn't give people new hearts before Jesus came. The new birth experience. The what? The new birth experience. And the law of the Spirit of Christ Jesus being written on the heart is specifically said to be that which marked the new covenant. By that he means the New Testament era. Not like the old. And is the main point of contrast. So according to Dale Ratzlaff, and, and uh, what I appreciate about him is he's consistent with his evangelical model. If you accept the evangelical model, you come to this kind of conclusion. You have to. Now, many don't, but they're not consistent. Ratzlaff takes this position because the term new birth doesn't occur until the New Testament period, so it could not have occurred historically until then. Likewise, was the Holy Spirit indwelling people, giving them new hearts. Even though the new heart, that term, only occurs in the Old Testament. It only occurs in the Old Testament. What's that? What does he do with Psalm 51? What does he do with Psalm 51? Yeah, where he's praying for a new heart. Yeah, a clean, cl clean heart, a clean heart. Yeah, good point. Um, okay. Um, so, we're... Uh, okay, we've got just enough time to do this. I want to reiterate again. Truths about the nature and character of God and the plan of salvation are timeless and universal regardless of when they were first revealed in Scripture. They did not spring into existence in the immediate historical period in which they were first announced in Scripture. Rather, they're trans-historical truths applying in both Old Testament and New Testament historical eras. They existed from the beginning. And we have these passages we've seen before where the, the commandment that God gave us uh, to love was from the beginning, even though after Jesus comes in history, it's new because we've seen this truth in him. The point is, the truths about the nature and the character of God and the plan of salvation are timeless and universal regardless of when they were first revealed in Scripture. They didn't spring into existence, the immediate historical period, when they were first announced in Scripture. All right. Um, so here's an, another example of that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start reading now because I've got a long way to go. Um, God has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his purpose of his own purpose and grace. So when was this first written, this statement? Yeah, after Jesus came, right? Paul's talking to Timothy here. Um, when did God begin saving people by his grace and calling them to live a holy life? Of course. Yes. And that, that's right here in the text. He saved us, called us to a holy life, not because of anything we've done, but because of his own great purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus when? Before, Before the beginning of time. But it's what? Now been, now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Je Christ Jesus. So here's the point. It was, it's now, though it's now, because it's now been revealed doesn't mean it wasn't true before, right? right? No, it was given to us before the beginning of time. My little pointer here. All right, did something with my pointer. Here it is. <coughs> yeah. Though it's revealed now, it's always been true. That's the point. That's the principle that's involved here. So we have saving grace that's transhistorical. It was given before the beginning of time, but now, not revealed until now. That language wasn't revealed until now. <coughs> um, Okay, Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and knowledge of truth that leads to godliness and the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised. When was this written? Again, New Testament period, right? Okay, when did God promise the hope of eternal life? Genesis 3.15, okay. Does it say, does he promise them eternal life explicitly? 
We can read that back into it, right? But he doesn't explicitly promise it there. You may be able to find some Old Testament texts that indicate that. Job, for instance, it's in, you can find texts in Job that, that indicate that. A couple in Psalms. Where does such an explicit promise first occur in Scripture? You'd have to look for it in order to find that. But notice this. God who does, uh, the hope of eternal life, which God who does not lie promised, when? Before the beginning of time. But, it, but now at this appointed season, he's brought it to light through the preaching entrusted to me. So, in other words, this truth that was promised before the beginning of time was in God's heart, certainly before the beginning of time, and, and, uh, and undoubtedly was told to Adam, even though we don't have it recorded that way. But now it's very explicit. Now it's been brought to light. Now in the New Testament period it's been brought to light. So even though it's written in the New Testament period, it applies <coughs> transhistorically, before the beginning of time. Okay, this one. Who first spoke these words? When was this first written? That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yeah, by Jesus. When did God so love the world he gave his son? Of course. The lamb was slain what? From the creation of the world. And we're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. He was chosen when? Before the, chosen before the creation of the world, but revealed in these last times. Revealed in these last times. So here you have the principle of progressive revelation throughout Scripture. Revealed throughout Scripture. God so loved the world he gave his beyond his Transhistorical. Chosen before the creation, but revealed in these last times. Always true. Always true. Okay, when did God's people first begin to have et- uh, put faith in him to have eternal life? Through faith. Coming back to that. Whoops. Let's go. Well. So we again, went to re- we review Hebrews 11 again. That they had faith all the way from Abel's time, and certainly Adam too, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> but they put their faith in who? Who were they putting their faith in back in Abel's time? In God. What name, by, what, by what name did they know him? By Yahweh, right? But who was it? It was Jesus. It was Jesus, wasn't it? It was Jesus. So we have this trans-historical truth again, that whoever believes in him, only God so loved the world he gave his son, whoever believes in him. It's always been true since the fall of Adam. It's always been true. <clears throat> so these things didn't just spring into existence. These truths about the nature and the character of God and the plan of salvation are timeless and universal, regardless of when they first revealed in Scripture. Now, most if not all of the truths about the nature and character of God and the plan of salvation that are not explicitly stated to be progressively revealed, like we've been looking at some who, who say it goes back to the beginning, it started in the beginning, now it's revealed to you. These things are true, but now it's revealed to you. Um, <clears throat> it's always been true with, from the beginning, but now it's been revealed to you. Some Many of the statements, many of the truths about the nature of God and the plan of salvation don't have that explicitly stated. That these things have always been true from the beginning. But yet it's, under, it's assumed and understood that that's true. That these revelations are timeless and universal truths. If they're about the character of God, the nature of God, and the plan of salvation, it's understood that that's true. For instance, this statement. The Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with the with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord, the Lord, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving his rebellion and sin, and so forth. When, who spoke these words? Yeah, when did he speak them? At Sinai, right? He spoke these words at Sinai. None of these characteristics of God were recorded in the scripture prior to this. You have to go back and look to see if that's true. You may say, well, here God's acting that way. Yes, but it doesn't describe him that way until you get to Sinai. Then it describes these things. So when did this description become true about God? Of course, from eternity past. From eternity past. So here we have, <coughs> though it, wasn't ex- it was explicitly revealed in this way until Sinai, it's always been true about God. Always been true about God. <coughs> so... 
even though most, if not all, of the truths about the, the uh, nature and character of God and the plan of salvation that are not explicitly stated to be progressively revealed and transhistorical, <coughs> in other words, revelations of timeless and universal truths, are assumed and understood to be so. If they're about the nature of God or the plan of salvation, that's true. So again, here's Paul's description. He's gathering up these Old Testament statements about the nature of man. No one's righteous, no, not, not even one. No one who understands. No one who seeks God. They've all turned away, become worthless. No one ha has done good, not even one. When was this first written? Well, you'd have to go back to the first psalm that he quotes and find out when that was first written. But putting them all together, Paul did that. He gathered them all together. But we can go back into the psalm somewhere. But when did this first apply to the human race? Of course, the fall of Adam. The fall of Adam. <clears throat> and in Romans, uh, the very next verse here, Paul says, we know whatever the law says, it says to those, the law meaning scripture here, obviously, because he's quoting, he's quoting, he doesn't quote anything from the, from the uh, Pentateuch. Um, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. So how many people and from what historical eras are held accountable to God? Everybody. No matter when they're born, no matter what what era? And we could say, well, some of these statements show up back here. Yeah, they do show up here, but they're still transhistorical, going all the way back to the fall of Adam. <coughs> okay, Ephesians chapter 2. Because there's great love for us. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you have been saved. <coughs> you know, it's something very interesting. Again, I appreciate this, even though, even though, to me, it just, it's uh, almost incomprehensible. But in this book, 400 plus pages, um, Dale Ratzlaff, against the Sabbath, very strong argument against the Sabbath. Um, even John MacArthur, past, past senior pastor of Grace Community Church, said this is a great book. Never once says that someone in the Old Testament was saved by grace through faith. Never once. What he says is that their righteousness was established by obedience to the law. Now, what I appreciate about Dale Ratzlaff, he's consistent. He's at least consistent. You have to take that position. If you read these passages about the law and the old covenant, as we've been reading through, through all last week, um, and we're going to see now, we're, gonna, we're coming to one in Galatians 3 now, and look at that one, then you have to take that position. So at least he's consistent about it. Consistent. E even, even, even though to me it shows where this will naturally and logically lead to. Pardon me? He's consistently wrong. Consistently wrong. Certainly on that point. <coughs> you know, not, not everything he says, some of there's some things that are quite inspiring that he says. But on this point, uh, and on the Sabbath, we believe um, very definitely wrong. So when did this truth first apply to humanity? That we're saved by grace through faith. When did that first apply to humanity? Yes, you can find this teaching in the Old Testament. Of course you can. But it's certainly as soon as Adam sinned, as soon as there was sin, right. there was salvation by grace through faith. It had to be. There's no other way of salvation. God has bound everyone over to disobedience. When did this become true? Yeah, as soon as Adam sinned. In other words, what I understand this to mean is God allowed people to be born into a world of sin. <coughs> it became true as soon as Adam fell. Then he allowed those children to come into existence as Paul described them, as the Old Testament describes them. Don't, they don't seek God. None are righteous. None do good. He allowed them to come in that way <coughs> um, because he had something in mind, didn't he? What was that? That he might have mercy on them all. That he might have mercy on them all. <coughs> yes, when did that become true? <coughs> of course, it's trans... Historical, isn't it? That no one disobedience so that he might have mercy on them all. <coughs> Reaching all the way back to the fall of Adam. Where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Again, we're kind of beating a dead horse to death here now, but just want you to see this point. It's established throughout. That statement was made in the New Testament, but, but the truth of it goes all the way back to where Adam sinned. <coughs> where, where, where Adam sinned. We confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. You can find something that sounds that, like that in Proverbs, 
but not before that, exactly that explicitly. <clears throat> first written in First John, you can go back to Proverbs and say, you know, we have it there too. Um, when did it first apply? Once again, same principle, all the way back to the beginning. And uh, remain in me, I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I remain in you, I will bear much, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So when was that truth revealed in that kind of language? When Jesus spoke the words, right? When Jesus spoke the words. <clears throat> the principle is there. When did it first become true? From the very beginning, wasn't it? <clears throat> Zechariah, toward the end of the Old Testament, says it in these words, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saying essentially the same thing. And uh, you might be able to find some scripture somewhere that kind of indicates that, but, but this has always been true, hasn't it? <clears throat> true for Adam, as he was originally created too, isn't it? That he could do nothing without, without Jesus? <clears throat> I believe it was true all the way back to Adam. Do you think it was true of the angels when they were first created? I think that's possible. Even the angels can do nothing without Jesus. Okay. So here we have the same thing operating here, the same principles operating. <clears throat> so this is our statement about progressive revelation. That uh, if truths are stated about the nature and character of God or the plan of salvation, they're timeless and universal, regardless of when they were first revealed in Scripture. And they don't have to explicitly be said to be timeless and universal. It's assumed that they are, because that principle has been established in numerous places. Within the timeless and universal contours of his plan of salvation, God's requirements for humankind were not always timeless and universal. God's requirement uh, re that to Noah to build an ark didn't apply to later generations. Circumcision was required of Abraham's descendants from the time God established his covenant with Abraham until the Jerusalem Council in, in 50 AD. Elaborate ceremonial and sacrificial official rituals were required of the Jewish nation until Jesus became our sacrifice and high priest, assumed his intercessory ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, as we just saw in Hebrews 7 through 10. When major changes to such kinds of requirements were made, they were explicitly revealed as such in Scripture. None of the Ten Commandments were ever explicitly rescinded, or even implicitly, in our understanding. Now we're back again to our passage that we're going to be looking at. Galatians 3, 15 to 25. This blend of historical and experiential elements representing progressively revealed truths of the plan of salvation. These truths, again, are timeless, universal, and transhistorical. Now we're prepared to hopefully think and challenge ourselves with this significant passage. <clears throat> what I'm going to do, rather than read, <clears throat> have, have, have us read it all again, I'm going to <clears throat> just remind us of what the evangelical saying that we're going to take it verse by verse, so we're going to read it again. They believe that passage teaches we're held in custody under the law during the Sinai period, and once Jesus comes, now we have faith in Jesus Christ. <coughs> and and uh, so they see this as an above-the-line historical application. Let's see what's going on here. <coughs> and the law is our guardian, no longer under a guardian. Being, coming in the middle with Jesus in history, and this is the, way, this is the one, this is Galatians 3.25, where they're saying this is talking about the Ten Commandments as well. Um, and now we're no longer under them, so therefore we no longer <coughs> need a Sabbath. We're asking the question, can this be understood, should it be understood, experientially and transhistorically, <coughs> rather than um, just historically? That's the question we're asking on this. All right, so um, I'm going to start taking it now just verse by verse. Verse 15, Galatians 3, talks about no one being able to set aside or add to a human covenant that's been duly established, and so it is in this case. This is how I understand this. What I'm going to do is just explain to you how I understand it. If we have a few minutes left over, we can talk about it, or we can talk about it on Wednesday morning, too. And you can, we can interact, <coughs> hopefully, uh, more with it then. I understand this to be, to be saying that God's covenant with humanity 
was framed in heaven before creation and cannot change. So therefore, it's a trans-historical statement. His promises made from the beginning and cannot change. <coughs> that's, why it refer, that's why it says um, that no one, uh, just as no one can set aside a, uh, or add to a human covenant that's been duly established, so it is in this case with God's covenant. It can't be changed. It's made in heaven by God himself, can't be changed. Verse 16, the promises were spoken to Abraham and his seed. Scripture does not say to seeds, meaning many people, and to your seed, but, me, but uh, and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. I see this as transhistorical in that God's covenant promises first given to Adam, reiterated to Abraham, because they weren't first given to Ada, Abraham. What was given to Abraham was that it was going to be through his seed that this child would come, um, it would bless the world. He would bless the world through the woman's seed in Genesis 3.15 and through Abraham's seed now, it's getting more explicit, um, <coughs> that is Christ would come. So we have Galatians 3.16 written and also uh, this is a explicating what was said back in Genesis, back in, in uh, Genesis 15 <coughs> And 17, God revealed he would bless the world through Abraham's seed, who is Christ, first promised and identified as the seed of the woman in Genesis 3.15. So these are trans-historical truths. <coughs> certainly, didn't, certainly didn't become that when, when Paul wrote it. Um, <coughs> okay, <coughs> so verse 17. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. <coughs> now Paul's coming out of an experience where he had related to the law in such a way that he'd forgotten that the plan of salvation was based on promise. <coughs> and then when he's after he's converted and he goes back down to Arabia and he restudies the whole Old Testament in light of, in light of uh, his new understanding of Christ and that he, Christ is the Messiah that they've been anticipating all this time, he realized, you know what? When, the law, when God gave the law, he didn't change the promise. He didn't do away with the promise. Promise was always the basis for the law. It was the basis for it from the, from the get-go. And so we have... In Genesis 3.17, the Sinai covenant incorporated the promises and revelations of the previous covenants and added new revelations of God's character in the plan of salvation. It was never intended to change the plan of salvation from a promise and grace-based system to a law-based one. The Sinai covenant incorporated grace-based gospel promises given in previous covenants. That's understood. It's understood to be <coughs> that the plan of salvation was the same. The, the, the Sinai covenant didn't change the plan of salvation. It just had <coughs> revealed other elements of it. But that had been misunderstood and misapplied <coughs> in Paul's experience. So the law introduced 430 years later didn't set aside the covenant previously established by God. It was all one covenant. And it was just a progressive revelation of that covenant. It didn't do away with the promise. <coughs> if the inheritance depends on the law alone, apart from the promise, it no longer depends on the promise. God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. It was given also to Adam through a promise. <coughs> and to every subsequent generation through a promise as well. But the Jewish people and Paul, foremost among them, <coughs> had focused on the legal elements and the law um, dissociated from the promises. So, the inheritance has always, transhistorically, been promise-based and grace-based, not law-based. That's what three, Galatians 3.18 is saying. <coughs> so again, it's a transhistorical revelation. The Sinai Covenant did not change the promise-based, grace-based plan of salvation into a law-based one. <coughs> He's just affirming that in these passages. Verse 19, then... Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. 
In other words, during their 400 plus years in Egypt, the Israelites lost their sense of the holiness and character of God and their own call to holy living. The Sinai Covenant was a progressive revelation of both. The character of God and what it means to live as a holy people for him. He's preparing them really for their, for their, uh, for their missionary uh, uh, mission and purpose. The institution of a more elaborate ceremonial system. So the Sinai Covenant is a progressive revelation of both the character of God and his holiness and our own call of holy living. And it's an institution of a more elaborate ceremonial system pointing forward to the redemptive mission of the Messiah <coughs> to come. So the transgressions in Egypt spiritually blinded the Israelites. The Sinai Covenant progressively revealed the character of God and a life of holiness, which were timeless and universal truths, just progressively revealed at Sinai to prepare them for their missionary witness and for the coming of Jesus. <coughs> That's how I understand that meaning. Again, everything is transhistorical <coughs> when you look at it. Now it talks about the law given through a mediator, uh, through angels entrusted to a mediator. Mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. Some of these things are kind of complicated. Even the greatest scholars are wondering exactly what's going through Paul's mind when he's writing some of these things. But <coughs> in essence, we can say very simply <coughs> that through the Sinai Covenant as a whole, Though the Sinai Covenant as a whole was delivered to Israel through the mediation of Moses, it originated from the one and only true God and was a progressive revelation of his singular covenant of grace. <coughs> so once again, these words written here were uh, Moses' mediation of the law does not deny its divine origin. That's the trans-historical element of this. Ten Commandments were not mediated by angels or Moses, but were spoken directly by God. All right, verse 21. Is the law of therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. The law had been given that could impart life. Righteousness would certainly have come by the law. So here he's just reiterating again what he already did in verse 17 earlier. Um, <coughs> the law didn't change the basis for salvation. It was always grace-based. And Paul's saying, I misunderstood that. In my pharisaical commitment to be faithful to God every way I knew how, I misunderstood that. <coughs> so the law, sin had taken occasion by the commandment and slain, slain him is what he's saying here, <coughs> in essence, going back to Romans 7. <coughs> so Galatians 3.21 is a reiteration of Galatians 3.17 that the Sinai covenant incorporated the promises and revelations of the previous covenants. It was never intended to change the plan of salvation from a promise-based, grace-based system to a law-based one. <coughs> God and his plan of salvation are the same from the entrance of sin to the very end. So again, we have that same <coughs> truth, eternal truth, timeless truth, universal truth, reiterated in verse 21. <coughs> Is the law opposed to the promise of God? No. And so forth. We just read that. Okay, now we're coming to the crucial passage. <coughs> verse 22. Scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin. The New King James Version says confine, has confined all under <coughs> sin. <coughs> when did this truth first begin to apply to humankind? That everything's locked, locked up under the control of sin. As revealed in Scripture, as Scripture reveals. <coughs> when did that first become true? When Adam fell, right? This fits the pattern of Scripture in terms of progressive revelation. Even though Paul says it here, it began, it began way back when Adam fell. Humanity has been locked up or confined under the control of sin, the flesh, disobedience, since Adam's fall. So, here we have again a reiteration of what we saw earlier. No one's righteous, and the whole world's held accountable for God, and so forth, from the, that we know is transhistorical. We looked at that previously. God bound everyone over to disobedience. We saw that in Romans 11:32. Now he's using this language. Scripture locks up everything under the control of sin. And uh, so that, it's, again, it's the same histor historical truth, same transhistorical truth. He's saying the same thing in this language. 
So this is trans-historical. It's a trans-historical truth. Scriptures locked everything up under the control of sin. God bound everyone over to disobedience. We're born in sin, etc. So that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Question, when did this truth first apply to humankind? That there was a promise? Yes. Back in Genesis, as soon as Adam sinned, right? As soon as Adam sinned, as soon as his posterity were bound over to disobedience, then came the, the promise of life through faith in Jesus Christ for those who believe. This is it's this trans-historical truth. The promise of salvation through faith in Yahweh, or Jesus, was given as soon as Adam fell. As soon as Adam fell. So we saw earlier, God bound and went over to disobedience so that he might have mercy on them all. God didn't wait till the New Testament time to have mercy on them all. This was transhistorically true, all the way back to the beginning. <coughs> and so we have in, in Galatians uh, 3, Scripture locking up everyone under the control of sin, the very next phrase in that, in that verse, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ, or Yahweh in the Old Testament, might be given to those who believe. This is transhistorical. This has always been true. This is not something new that's coming onto the scene when Paul writes these words in Galatians 3 or when Jesus comes in history. So this is transhistorical. If you notice now, phrase by phrase, line by line, verse by verse, we're seeing transhistorical application, transhistorical application, transhistorical application. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody or kept under guard by, New King James Version, the law. In what we have here, <coughs> locked up until the faith that is to come <coughs> would be revealed. <coughs> when did this first, first truth first apply to humankind? Yeah, when sin entered. Exactly. <coughs> is there a way that this can be understood we're held in custody, kept under the law, until this faith is revealed? We've got to understand it historically. <coughs> um, or should it be understood entirely experientially? That depends on this phrase here. You see, this faith and the faith, rather than just faith, it has the article with it. <coughs> now, in the book, I don't deal with this because I the translation I was using didn't have this distinction. The, new, the, the uh, new internet, the, the 2011 New International Version, which is I've switched all my slides over to 2011, does have the article translated. And some translations do translate the article. Others don't. It's a call of the, uh, by the translators. And so what they're saying is, the term this faith is referring to Jesus. It's not referring to human faith, it's referring to Jesus. So what they're saying, this is saying, is before the coming of Jesus, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until Jesus that was to come would be revealed. That's, that's the way they're, 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 they're uh, thinking of this. So... Um, this faith, the faith, when would it be revealed? There's, Jesus came in history or at conversion? That's the question. When was this revealed? Is it revealed, uh, we're held in custody until Jesus comes in history and this faith is revealed? Or until we're converted? We're kept in custody under the law until we're converted. <coughs> um, I, want you to, I want us to look at the very next verse. Galatians 3, 26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through what? Faith. Through faith. Now what's interesting here is that this term through faith is the Greek term. It has the article there, the faith. It's fairly rare in the New Testament that you have the article. But here the New International Version is not consistent. Here it translates it, the fa this faith, the faith. And again, we're going to have the fa this faith in verse 25. But here it has exactly the same Greek term, the faith. But yet it doesn't translate it, the faith, because it doesn't make sense there. It doesn't make sense there. And there are other versions who do the same. The New King, New King James Version does not translate it. it. It just says through faith the New American Standard Bible, and there would be many other versions. There's just a couple that I checked. 
does not have this faith here. Because it would then be through Jesus in Jesus. I mean, it makes no sense. So up here, there's a question whether this should be translated, whether you can just say this faith means Jesus coming in history. It's more likely to be, I know this is complicated, and there are whole books. This is one of the debates in Christianity today, in, in scholarly circles, is what does the faith mean? And the faith of Jesus, what does that mean? Does that mean Jesus' faithfulness to God's mission for him? Or does it mean our faith in Jesus? Is it subjective or, or objective genitive for the Greek scholars? Um, I believe that, that uh, overall, when you look at the whole passage, that, there, that the evidence swings in this direction. That it should be understood experientially rather than... <coughs> I know this is complicated, but um, in the book it's much simpler because I don't deal with this because I, I didn't have this... I wasn't even aware, or it, was, it just hadn't occurred to me that that would be an issue um, as much as it has been more, more recently, has kind of become an issue. <coughs> but it's also true that, uh, that Jesus coming in history engendered faith in every generation with the same kind of mystery as to how him coming in history accomplishes forgiveness in every generation, but it does. <coughs> and him coming in history also um, in the divine economy of things um, engenders faith in every generation. So we have, <coughs> just as Christ's sacrifice in history accomplished forgiveness for people in every historical era, as we saw in Hebrews 9, 16, very clearly says that. He's now died, now he's died, to set them free from the sins committed in the first covenant. <coughs> so we have this principle that forgiveness is applied, it, it was available experientially to people even though it was, a, it was ratified when Jesus came in history and accomplished then. The same way that's true with faith, that his sacrifice enabled faith in every generation. <coughs> and that's how I see this reference to the, for the coming of this faith where held in custody of the law like until the faith come to be revealed. It's experiential, but it's also based on, uh, here it's very clearly, faith in Jesus Christ that's the focus here. To everyone who believes. And so you do have Jesus coming in history, but it enables faith in every generation. You have that experiential application. So you have the law pointing to Jesus, and then Jesus is faith coming. <coughs> if you take that interpretation of that, um, I see them working together, blending. All are held in custody under or kept under guard by the law, both held accountable by the law and with the karma principle as one's only resource and hope if you don't have Jesus. Until Jesus is revincible, until Jesus is revealed to them and they experience conversion and new birth by the Holy Spirit. That's how I understand the dominant meaning of that passage. <coughs> We're held in custody, in other words, in an unconverted state, until the faith in Christ that was to come at conversion would be revealed. They definitely can make a case for this, for this, the transhistorical understanding of that passage. <coughs> Verse 24, the law is our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now think about what this is saying. The law is our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. According to that verse, if all you have is that one verse, what must happen before someone could be justified by faith? According to that verse. You have to be under the law? What else must happen? Christ has to come, right? Until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. According to this passage, you can't be justified by faith until Christ comes, right? He has to come in history before you can be justified by faith. If, if, if you understand this his historically, Christ must come. What must happen before you can be justified by faith? Christ must come. That's what that says. Your, the law is our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Nobody was saved before came, right? What's that? Nobody could have been saved before he came in history, if that's, if that's the case. <coughs> so when did justification and righteousness by faith begin? Of course, all the way back from Adam's sin, right? <coughs> um, 
So here's what I understand this to mean. Justification only occurs after Jesus comes. Therefore, this verse must be applied experientially and transhistorically. The laws are guarding until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. They were being justified by faith from way back here. So the coming of Christ must be coming in conversion. Personally, coming to someone in conversion. That's how you understand that. I understand that when you say Christ comes in history, therefore he can engender faith all the way back. So there's a blending again of the, <coughs> of the two, but it has an experiential focus. Christ comes and we're justified by faith. And what comes in the middle is conversion. Uh, let me go on and we'll, we may have a little time here at the end. <coughs> so again, we have transhistorical. Transhistorical application. You have transhistorical applications all the way through, beginning from verse 15, straight on through. And that's what this will have. When you go back over this, it'll give the justification for transhistorical, transhistorical understanding. So note, every verse in this passage thus far, we could go all the way back to verse 15, has a transhistorical application. In some cases, it may be, there may be an element of the, his, of the, of the uh, uh, Jesus coming in history, a historical above the line application, but also has a below the line application in every single case. Should we expect the same thing in verse 25? That's the question. Now that this faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. King James Version has schoolmaster. New King James American Standard has tutor. <coughs> Whatever. How to understand this. So this is how it's understood in evangelical <coughs> circles generally. The law is our guardian. And then we're no longer under a guardian once Jesus comes. You put, put in schoolmaster, tutor, <coughs> whatever here. Some questions about this. Does the Holy Spirit use the moral law of God? To, because that's what that's used to say that the Ten Commandments are no longer, by some, by some, not all evangelicals. We're talking during the break about how the Reformed tradition of Christianity um, holds the Ten Commandments the same as we do. They believe that the seventh day element of the Sabbath has been changed, but they still hold to the sanctity of the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God, um, and uh, that the that the the others have been fulfilled in that they've been retired, they're obsolete now, the ceremonial laws. Does the Holy Spirit use the moral law of God to rein in sin and bring conviction of, of sin before a person comes to Jesus? Is that true? Yes. When in history did this function of God's moral law begin? Yes, as soon as Adam sinned, right? Certainly as soon as he sinned. And when did it end? When did it end? When in history did it begin that when Jesus came into the life of a person by faith, they were no longer under a guardian? Was this in New Testament times only? That that's true? That's the question. Everything in this lecture is leading up to this. So, in Romans 7, how did Paul say that he became aware of his sin? Yes, by the law. And what specific portion of the law? Not only the Ten Commandments, but as Stanley has pointed out, it's that one commandment that looks at the heart and the motivation and the thinking. But it is from the Ten Commandments, right? So in other words, in the New Testament time, God's, the Holy Spirit's still using the Ten Commandments to bring conviction, to bring conviction of sin. So Romans 7, though written here, it was, was written here, but uh, long after the, or, or after, you know, several decades after, the, after uh, Jesus came in history, and when we're supposed to no longer be under a tutor, God's still using the Holy Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit's still using the law of God to bring conviction of sin. Um, so when an Old Testament believer was justified by faith, did the Ten Commandments cease to have value for them? Once an Old Testament person was justified by faith, did the Ten Commandments seek to have value for them? In other words, did, did the moral law of God cease to be a tutor then, once they became uh, an, a, an, a guardian for them, once they became uh, justified by faith? 
What did God want to do with his law? Write it in their minds and hearts, right? What law is this talking about? This isn't talking about the ceremonial law. This is the Sinai. God wanted to write his letter in their hearts. And all the way through the Old Testament, we saw passage after passage where the prophets are saying, um, your law is within my heart. And Isaiah 57, where he's talking to the righteous people, saying, my people who have my law in your hearts, because God put it there. These were justified people, people of faith. Should it be any different for a New Testament believer? Should the law function differently in that sense? The moral law of God functioned differently in the New Testament era than it did <coughs> in the Old Testament era. Because look, it's the same promise. The New Covenant in Hebrews is the same as it was in Jeremiah. It's the same promise, the same as it was all the way through the Old Testament. It's a trans-historical reality and trans-historical truth. God wants to write his law in our minds. You have this now in your book, but I'm going to go through it quickly. Um, Protestantism, this is part of the, the conflict here because Protestantism, even Lutheranism, even the Lutheran, the Augsburg Confession, talks about the three uses of God's law. And it's talking about the moral law, the three uses of the law. Even though Lutheranism um, feels the Ten Commandments are outdated and obsolete now that, Jesus, that Christ has come. Um, as such, as the Ten Commandments. But Protestantism, <coughs> in all the, the major confessions, Christian confessions, acknowledges three timeless uses of the role of the moral law. The first is what they call civil law, and I, I cite this in, in, uh, in your book, uh, which is to maintain order in society. In other words, even, be, even if a person never accepts God, never is converted, the civil law is important to just to maintain order in society. It has that value. That's one of the purposes for which God gave it, according to, according to this, this uh, viewpoint. Then there's a tutorial role to lead sinners to Christ. And finally, what they call the normative role, to be a rule of life for believers. And I quote John Calvin <coughs> in, the, in, the, in your book um, that said he believed the normative role of the Ten Commandments was the chief role, applying to believers after they're converted. So we have, I want you to notice here, here now, coming down, dropping down to verse 23, before the coming of this faith, we're held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that has come and be revealed. I'm going to suggest <coughs> that this is, here they're still held, held in custody under the law. When we're held in custody under the law, that could be a civil use or a civil role of the law where even if a person de never does accept Christ, they never do, they never do come to faith, it still has that value for them. Then the law is our guardian until Christ comes that we might be justified by faith. The Holy Spirit uses the law to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. That's a tutorial use of the law. And then I'm suggesting that the final one, now that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. In other words, no longer needing the law to serve in merely its civil use or tutorial use because it's brought us to faith in Christ, but, but having, having graduated as a believer to its normative use in our life as a guide, a uh, principle, a guide to, the, to uh, how to live um, faithfully to God. <coughs> All right, the very term, Hebrew term, dabar, dabar um, can be translated word, command, and promise. And it is in various, trans some translations have, in the same text, they'll translate it these different ways. Different translations will. <coughs> the ten words, the ten commandments, are also ten promises. Um, it's the same thing. They would write it the same way. The ha-davarim would be the same. <coughs> Wouldn't be any different Hebrew terminology. So the Hebrew construction allows the ten words to be emphatic imperatives. And again, I give the documentation for that. Dr. Davidson helped me with that. Um, or ten commandments or emphatic promises, ten promises. So here we have, um, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We know he hears us. Whatever we ask of him, we know we have what we ask of him. Beautiful promise, by the way. 
1 John 5, 14, 15. I'm sorry I'm having to race through it. What is necessary to know to, what is necessary to know to be sure our request will be answered? What do we need to know according to this? Do we ask anything according to his will? We need to know what his will is, right? If we know what his will is, we can be assured we'll get the answer. How can we know what God's will is? It was expressed in Scripture, right? If it's expressed in Scripture, we know what his will is. Can we know for sure the Ten Commandments are God's will? Yes. I think we can know for sure. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, If anyone asks God to write his law in their hearts, which he said it is his will to do, we can have confidence he will do it. His law is his promise of what he will do for us if we ask him to do it. So we have uh, an experiential view. You have uh, uh, Galatians 3, 24 and 25 especially, but the whole passage of the covenants and law understands Galatians 3, 24, 2 to 25 to be presenting how the law works in the life of sinners and believers in every historical era within the context of God's everlasting covenant to save them. God uses his law viewed as mere commandments to restrain sinners in society. A karmic view of the law misses and abuses it, relying on obedience to, marry, to merit a future reward. That's the karmic view. You who want to be under the law. That's what Paul's referring to here when he says, you who want to be under the law. In other words, the karmic principle. Um, the Holy Spirit uses his law, number two, the second use, to awaken a sense of sin and need of a Savior to lead sinners to Christ and faith in Christ. And three, writes his law in the hearts of believers as a guide to holy living, his new covenant promise. <coughs>